Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this very, very special edition of the Astrology Hub podcast. We have been waiting for this episode for a couple months now, and I am so excited to share it with you. Today, we are joined by medical and vocational astrologer Judith Hill, and the topic for today is karma reincarnation and astrology. And Judith is so amazing. She gave us several different talk topics that we could do today. And we put all of the options out to our inner circle. And this subject just overwhelmingly came back as the number one vote. So I'm so excited to have you here, Judith. I know it's been like four or five years since we last connected, and I'm just so grateful to have you back. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. I'm thrilled to be back, and I hope you all hear me okay with this this new mic situation. And uh, yeah, people really love this subject. And uh, Amanda was asking me before we went on uh, why I thought people loved this subject. And it could be that in our particular culture, there just isn't enough information about what happens before birth, what happens after death. Uh, is reincarnation real? And how does it interact? How does the, the chart indicate uh, something about your past lives? Mm. That is very interesting to people. And before we begin, I want to say that I totally respect any listeners who do not believe in reincarnation. There are lots of explanations for how astrology works without believing in that. I, of course, am a believer or we wouldn't be talking today. This is going to be my topic. So for people that don't, well, we, and, and just in one second, I'm going to ask you to please share your story about how you came to astrology and especially how you came to practice the type of astrology that you do. Um, but for people that don't believe in it, there's still ways to sort of encapsulate the ideas or the messages about lifetimes within one lifetime, right? Yes, yes. Uh, you can see the birth chart because we are talking karma, reincarnation and astrology. So you can see the birth chart as just uh, your plan for this lifetime and uh, your very unique, uh, you know, the universe or God made you a unique snowflake. You're all your own. No one's just like you. And you're going to have lessons and strengths and weaknesses. And this can, paradigm can fit into any religions. Every uh, You can use astrology in many ways. Uh, so uh, that's important to know. Hmm. About, Wonderful. About this. Okay. So Judith, tell us a little bit about you and how you came to be the astrologer that you are today. And especially with your focus on medical and vocational astrology as well. Yes. And I have a funny story because I couldn't not be an astrologer. So people have heard, some people have heard this and uh, it's all in, uh, Tony Howard did an interview with me that was featured in the Christmas issue of TMA in 2011 or something going into all this. But when I was a, a wee thing, I was three years old, my father sat me on his knee and began to show me his collection of charts. And I was like, oh, of course, I totally recognized these. And I hardly spoke when I was three. And then when I was 10, he began to apprentice me. And he apprenticed me for four years very intensely. And I hardly did my homework and um, my schoolwork. I was just into this. And then uh, when I was, but I was always studying herbs. And I was always interested in how this could be practical. And this was at a time when astrology practice was illegal where I lived. And it wasn't considered a viable career. You had to be very courageous to do this. And we really broke a lot of uh, you know, glass ceilings. And so then when I was 14, my mother suddenly died. And she came from a long line of rabbinical scholars and so forth. And uh, so she was quite the scholar. But I was going to be on my own very soon. And I did my first paid reading at 14. And I started doing it for, um, you know, remuner remuneration. And then when I was uh, 17, I was on my own. And I basically opened a, a practice and began by 21 full time. I've been doing it full time ever since, but always wanting to seek real practical applications because I grew up very working class and all the men were plumbers and electricians and my father was a printer and and I, I was very enamored with people who had skills and I didn't think astrology was a skill what well, little did I know at that time so I, so I started studying you know the medical and the vocational and it became very natural to me 
And, you know, I went on to become an herbalist. And then I discovered quite late in life that this was the medical system of the Middle East and Europe uh, for the, all through the Renaissance medieval period, ancient Greece, they conflated astrology and herbalism. That was the medical system. And it's not dissimilar to Chinese medicine. So I began to study that intensely and then started producing the Renaissance medicine conferences. And then away we went. <laughs> That's how it happened. Amazing. Judith, what kind of astrology did your father practice? And how did he, he was learn? just, uh, oh, he's got a story. Oh my goodness. Well, this is very strange to say. And, uh, but this is what he says. He was a young man in the army and he was walking down. Uh, he was in San Francisco, I believe, Presidio at the time. And he said he was a deep clairvoyant. He was very, very clairvoyant man. And he'd been a, a monk in the Vedanta order and a number of odd things he'd done. And he said he knew that an old astrologer would be reborn to him and he would need to teach that person. So he said he walked all day down, uh, down through San Francisco looking for one book. In those days, there were no books. He found one book on astrology and he trained himself. And then he got very, very good in the army. And he has a lot of very, very funny army stories where they, the, the, you know, the sergeants would test him and he had to appear before board and all kinds of things. And then, so he, he trained me and he was just a straight up uh, he would just look at a chart. He was more of a clairvoyant. He would look at a chart and he would declare the way that person would die or some other thing. And every single thing he told me about my life has come true. Wow. And there was no way that I could know that those things would come true. But the thing was, he was very working class. And every time I asked him what I should do for a living, he would say, be a house cleaner. That's a good job. He always wanted me to be a house cleaner. And he thought I had a great sense of humor. So he also thought I should be a clown. And these were his two <laughs> careers for me. And it just never quit. But he did teach me astrology and he made me the logo that's still on my chart. And, but, you know, to him, you know, why have an education when you can clean houses? You know, he, we, we came from, uh, it wasn't very wealthy. <laughs> so, he, he must be so proud of you now, wherever he is, right? I presume, I presume. Um, I hope so. I hope so. He's, he's a very, very amazing guy. And he was wow. completely self-educated and could do anything. That is so cool. And then another question, this is so fascinating to me because I think so many of us forget that astrology was illegal not that long ago. I mean, it really, if you look in the span of time, it has not been that long that we've actually been able to practice astrology out in the open and not have to hide the craft. So when did it actually become legal? And were you a part of that at all? Um, I was cowering because at the time, right when they were making it legal, they were, they dragged a few ladies in my city off to jail oh and with all their books, some old ladies, probably just like me, you know, <laughs> and, uh, uh, they, uh, it was 1989. It was legalized in many states. Uh, different states are different, but that is not too long ago. And many of the listeners are probably born in 19, around 1989 or earlier. And so, um, but even after it was legalized, it was still considered a disreputable profession. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the library uh, and you look up the vocational guides, which you know were tomes this thick, there were two of them, and you look up astrologer, it would be listed as entertainer. Oh. No, they didn't consider this serious. Always, they had a rule in the media, and I knew people who were reporters and ran radio stations. They could not interview an astrologer without somehow besmirching it or making you look foolish. Mm. And if you remember Quinley, the uh, astrologer to Reagan, so she gets interviewed on TV, and they they instantly started to try to poke fun at her. She stood up, pressed. She was very professional. She went like this and she said the interview is now over and she yeah. walked off the screen oh and that's so great I she was one that. of the most dignified astrologers i've ever seen on tv but that's what we put up with you couldn't really tell people what you did i still have a hard time discussing this with my relatives yeah uh, you know who my, my my cousins and things because they i think they would think i was foolish mm -hmm. or some they think you're a fraud in that case but things are changing aren't they amanda 
They are changing and, and it's, there's a lot of remnants of that still. Sometimes I look at the way that astrology is portrayed in the more mainstream media outlets and they, they always find a way, not always, most of the time, find a way to make it look silly. You know, they'll have like a photograph of a person with like, that looks super spacey with like planets flying around their head. It's like, really, you know, and it just, it's, it's still there, but it's definitely changing. That's for sure. It's t- we need to rise up and stop this. I remember a few years ago, there was the great economic uh, astrologers conference in San Francisco, and mm-hmm. it was on TV. They're having a conference. So they have the reporter announcing this in front of a giant neon palmistry sign that says something like Madame Zolar's, you know, uh, you know, and, and I was like, these these uh, stock market and financial astrologers are very sophisticated. Oh, people. Yes. Oh and my this gosh. was insulting, very insulting to their craft. And it wasn't even their craft. You know, right. they're astrologers. I love palmistry. I study it, but you know what I mean? Yes, it's I do. It's Hollywood. I do. Yes. And it's one of the reasons why it's been so important to us at Astrology Hub to make sure that the astrologers are, are shown in a, in a light that is true, you know, that yes. we give a platform that is uh, legitimate and solid and with integrity and all these things, because that was the thing that I first noticed when I came in. It's like, these people are incredible. So intelligent, so wise. Um, so, I mean, so a lot of v- very educated, you know, but no one would ever know that because of the way that it's portrayed. Um, Judith, I know already I could talk to you forever about all these topics. There's like so many different rabbit holes. I already would, would love to go down, but you, you really have made an incredible career for yourself. It's amazing to hear that this started when you were basically three, um, but you, you have, you're an award winning author of 13 different books. Um, you have your own school and you're really, you've really made a huge difference in the world of astrology. So again, very grateful that you're here. And let's talk about karma and reincarnation and astrology. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so the I, before I, I found a quote that just says it all, and I wanted to read it. it. I believe this was from Edgar Casey. I forgot to write down who it was. It was either him or Yogananda, and it says here, "The astrological stars of a person are nothing but an environment that he, he or she, or them." has chosen by the karmic pattern um, he, she, them, has fastened, fashioned by his past life actions. According to this karmic pattern, he, she, them, is attracted to be reborn on earth at a given time that is favorable to the fulfillment of that pattern. And that says it better than I could say it. It's just beautifully written. Hmm. And that is, you look at your chart and the chart will say something, provided you believe that this is so, you know, if you believe in reincarnation, the chart will give hints of what you did before. And where do we see, where do we start with that exploration? Ah, well, this is very, I have a list of things. It's, it's very, very, um, uh, first of all, there's a tradition in the Jyotish system, the astrology of India, called um, Pancha Mahapurusha Yoga. And it's very similar to an ancient Greek way of looking at things. I'll give a few things you can look at. If you have a planet that is exalted or in its own sign on an angle, that planet supposedly, its qualities had been very highly developed in a previous incarnation. Now, similarly, if it is in its fall or detriment, you might have done some bad deeds with it. Mm. Now, this is not an amoral philosophy. In other words, there is bad and good. Some people don't prefer that way of thinking. Uh, But you can say if you were born with Jupiter rising in Cancer or Sag, you might have been a a Jupiter in Cancer, say the the great protector. Uh, Jupiter gives wisdom. It gives being a guru or a teacher or a person of great wealth and generosity. If Mars is rising or in the midheaven or on the, you know, on an angle in Aries, you might have been a warrior. Um, but then you combine this with your the law of habit. The law of habit is, you know, whatever you keep doing, you get real good at. And you develop what we call a proclivity, a, an affinity, a tendency. 
so like remember little Mozart, baby Mozart is born, you know, and he's climbing up on the piano and, you know, symphonies by the age of, you know, three, and they don't know how he does it. That's because he's been working on this for lives. So mm. the law of habit shows your whole chart is a law of habit. If you have, you know, five planets in the fifth house and you just, ad- and you look at yourself, what are your proclivities? You just adore the theater and he- you're dressing up in, in capes and things at the age of two. And it's all about theater. Well, you were a a performer before. It's this simple. It's not hard. And the astrologer needs to look at their intuition too. But Mm. there's a lot more. So I want you to plug me with your questions. (laughs) Nice. So, So essentially we can see the law of habit showing up in childhood. So those natural proclivities, things that we're drawn to, especially things that may or may not be super, um, saturated in our environment, right? Yeah. Like those yeah, things like, really show an indication that this is something you actually, this is like an energy you rode in on, correct? Yeah, like a, if a child, a child's, well, children will have strange phobias. There was one little girl I knew, she was terrified of totem poles and kept dreaming of them, absolutely p- waking up panicked with dreams of totem poles. Uh, you have children who have strange obsessions, like the, there was a little boy I knew who was obsessed with sculpture and how it was done, you know, from very early age, you know, real old time sculptures. The other boys are not. Um, You have, now when I was a tiny child, I would spend hours taking marbles and segregating them into different groups that they were different groups of people. And I've always been fascinated with typology, which is astrology Mm -hmm. and, it's just fascinated me. So it's tiny little things, fears, phobias, obsessions, and great talents, great talents are what are, are a hint. Also great attractions to like, if you're walking along and you're just, you're just mad crazy about nautical supplies and you just can't get out of the nautical shop or you love everything old West or, you know, these are a hint as what you did before. Why would you, you know, your hair stand up on end uh, uh, every time you get near musical instruments? I just love musical instruments. You know, it's just, why? What, what is this? It's a memory if you believe in reincarnation. Mm. It reminds me of what we were talking about before we went live because I commented on your harp and I said, I've yes. often had this fantasy of having my own personal harpist follow me around because I just <laughs> love to be enveloped in the sound of the harp. And she goes, and Judith says, well, you must have been um, part of the Druids and and part of the royalty. What is it, royalty in the Druids? Well, it, it was it was the king. I don't know what the chieftain, the, the priest or the priestess or things like that. You know, in the Druids. Yeah. And and I just went, what? I didn't even know that was a thing because I guess they all had harpists that would follow it, them around. And it's like, I guess I'm remembering that on some level. So it's it's a it's there. Now, when you talk about the fall or detriment, so if we have planets that are in fall or detriment. So they're, they're not exalted, right? Like, for example, I have Saturn and Leo, that would be fall and de- or detriment. Yeah, that would be a, um, that's in its detriment. And right. if it was on an angle, um, it, it could mean that, you know, Saturn always gives power. Uh, but if it's, if you're born with that, it gives great power. But uh, now Saturn's your planet of redemption means you may have gone too far or become too strong an ego in this life having to learn to handle power uh in this life um saturn is the planet of rebound karma so we we can talk about you know other things in the chart so everybody has a saturn but you may not have wanted to depart the subject we were on about (laughs) detriments and and everything so Everything in your chart will show something about, in this system, what you did before. But it's the ones that are really standing out that, uh, you know, tell you your, everybody wants to know their good stuff. And uh, a strong planet in its detriment doesn't mean it's at all necessarily bad. I've seen some fantastically powerful people with Saturn rising in Leo, my goodness. But the thing that it does is it shows us too where there's opportunity, like karmic opportunity, right? Because I, I, I'm i actually aware of that. Uh, and, and when I was younger, I didn't want any sort of power or leadership 
And I know it's because I was afraid that I would misuse it or I wouldn't use it right or something. So, yeah. so that it's been something that I've gotten to work with, which has been really interesting actually, because the more awareness we have, then we can actually take responsibility for our gifts in a different way. Right. That is amazing. I've noticed, I know two other people with Saturn and Leo who do exactly that. They'll get in positions of power and then they'll suddenly leave them for fear of uh, having misused them or they, they go Doing back and wrong. forth with this. It's the issue, you know, <laughs> yes. the issue or ego yes. is the issue, you know. Right. But so Saturn, um, we have uh, two places you can look in your chart for where you might have some difficult karma. Would you like me to go into that a little? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so of course Saturn. Uh, Saturn, we have, we have several types of karma. And I'm gonna, this is very easy to understand. If you take a ball and throw it at a wall over and over again, you're going to get a very strong arm. And that's what these planets on angles, uh, either, in, either in, in any extreme condition, good or bad, you can practice being a criminal for lives. It's going to show. <laughs> I have lots of cases of this. I've watched people grow up by now many times. Uh, some of my clients are now having their grandchildren. But um, the, um, so you get a strong arm. That's your law of habit, karma. And then the ball bounces back and you're going to get rebound or return karma. Like the kids in the, the, the kids in the, they'll say, uh, you know, what goes around comes around, you know, when you're little, that's yeah. Saturn. And Saturn also gives you an opportunity for redemption, working very hard with that issue. And then Saturn is the bringer of wisdom. He really is, or she, it's a he in tradition. But so your Saturn position will often show where you have some limitation, some difficulty, some big lesson to learn. I always say, if you don't work with Saturn and learn Saturn's lesson, you will be forced to tell Saturn works. You'll just be forced to. Mm -hmm. And it's always an issue in the life, house and sign. But the South Node, South Node is a very interesting place in the chart. It either shows where there's a past life memory you know, leaking up from the subconscious, you get your phobias, you get your neurosis. It also shows uh, a place where you're allowed to pay off a karmic debt. So you often have to do things purely for the good. Usually you can't gain where the South Node is usually, except in rare cases. So you, you do a sacrificing selfless work. Many astrologers and healers are born with the South Node on the 1st or the 10th. I've seen this all the time. Those are South Node types of careers. You're helping people. Sometimes there's a great deficiency, sorrow or loss where that South Node is. And sometimes it means a, a true genius from the past life, but you're not going to be able to get wealthy or gain money off it easily. You're supposed to do it for the good of all. But that's sort of what you come in with. And that can take many, many perturbations, you know. Uh, so I wanted to just add that... Um, I, I'll just use this as an opportunity. I do have one book all about this, the, the, the Lunar Nodes, um, Your Key to Excellent Chart Interpretation. It goes a lot into the nodes east, the nodes west, every possible conjunction to and from them, natal, the houses, the transits to, and it's, they're all about karma. Uh, they're all about karma. Um, or if you don't believe in uh, reincarnation, they still have a lot of spiritual implication. And it, they really are, uh, you really do get an excellent chart interpretation if you can understand them very well. So I wanted to tell people about that book, because not a lot of people know about it. And I consider it one of my very, very best. Um, okay. <laughs> yes. So so Judith, is it, a, is it a, well, first of all, can we get that on, on any, in any location? Oh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, the American Federation of Astrologers, Inc. I like to support uh, yes. astrologers. Yes. 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 Buy from them. <laughs> yes. American. What'd you say? Uh, a, the AFA Inc. INC American Federation of Astrologers, Inc. is the biggest astrological publisher, I believe in the world. They carry all my books and they do carry that one. Again, the lunar nodes, your key to excellent chart interpretation. Um, there's two astrologers with very similar name to mine. So make sure you, you get that right. Okay. <laughs> so. All right. Judith Hill. And we'll look for that book. And is it an oversimplification to say that 
the journey in this lifetime is from the south node energy to the north node energy? Is that an oversimplification um, or it, how would you say it that? Is, it is. It's pretty good. It's, 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 it works most of the time. But there are many, many other ways to interpret these nodes. Um, so say if, uh, if you have the, the south node um, rising in cancer, you're going to come in with a lot of uh, very, very, very sensitive, you know, somewhat, you could come in very fearful. You could have a lot of emotional pain or fear. Uh, but south node in Sagittarius might mean you're a real hellion. You, you, know, da, 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 da. you, you can't stand, uh, it always gives an extreme. You can't stand, you have to be independent. You can't stand any claustrophobic. You, no one can control you. And, but it can lead to lack of life direction. So the north node will tend to be, very good question, Amanda, because the, the north node tends to be, in most cases, uh, what they call the Dharma point. That's in the Hindu, not the Buddhist meaning. In the Buddhist, it means the teaching. It means the work that's right for you to do mm. that benefits you this time around. Um, Michael Luton, I think it was, said that it, that the south node was the, the chocolate cake and the north node was the, the Zweibach diet food that nobody wants. But some people, the south node is a point of fear or phobia. So it varies. And some people, the north node is a point of materialistic obsession and greed. So they don't like the north node in Jyotish because it binds you to this plane. And their name, the name in the east for the south node is Moksha Karaka, um, the indicator of enlightenment. Why? Because all of this loss that you get at the south node teaches you not to be attached to anything on this plane. Mm -hmm. And even though it brings loss, they prefer it. The action and function of the nodes is identical east and west. How they are interpreted and why is opted. So we love the north node in the west because it brings us connections and wealth and people. And it tends to be a happy spot, you know, for getting what we want. But you know, karmically, you know, in many cases, it's a point to develop. If, however, you have all your planets loaded on your north node and your south node is a singleton off somewhere, usually you have to develop the south node, a more spiritual view, or use, it's the, it's the door to spirituality, or use all that energy you have for a sacrificing purpose. Mm -hmm. You have to look at the chart, but yeah, it, it's, a, it's interesting. And um, yeah, so there's nuance here. It's not, oh. you, can't, you can't blanket statements say your south nodes, what you keep, what you've developed and your north nodes, where you're going and what you want to develop that there's a lot more nuances to this. Yes, it's very nuanced. That's why I'm perturbed at philosophies that give one meaning to the node. Mm -hmm. And the node, that's why my book gives all the meanings east and west different. It's very subtle. And if the south node is conjunct a planet, this is a karmic condition. Uh, often a person is going to have a loss or suffering at that point with that planet energy or a great genius from the past mm -hmm. that they must use selflessly. Mm -hmm. uh, that is very important. Um, we also have a, a point of when does karma come to us? When does it hatch? You know, you're going along, tra la 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 la, splat. This happens, and happened to me many times. <laughs> you know, why did that happen to me? You know, why now? Um, or you're going along, and just all of a sudden, uh, you inherit a million dollars out of Uncle Ted, who you didn't know existed, and your life is now roses. Um, why do these things happen to people? Well, you, the things. Think of this chart like a garden full of seeds. So that there's seeds hiding in the garden, sleeping latently. Um, and one fine day, this is like that Motown count song, one fine day. <laughs> I always love that expression. One fine day. Here comes, you know, transit Saturn to your south node. And it's in the sixth house. And all of a sudden you get some disease. Now, can you remediate this? You know, yes, in some cases, not all. We're going to talk about that. But uh, karma is hatched by the weather, astrological weather, often in combination with a progression. The progression gets there. It can get there a year early, a year late. 
the transits will come and make it happen. And so we all have a plan of life when certain things are going to happen. And um, that is also, you know, the gift of astrology because we can certainly look at a chart and see, well, look at that. Can that be prevented? Now, it's my personal philosophy, Amanda, that if you ha can look at that chart, it can be prevented because it is now in your karma to see it, to think about what you might do to offset it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in India, they have all kinds of chants and things. But there's many, many ways of um, avoiding a difficult possible karma. And so if you, once you have the awareness, then like go back to that example of, of a uh, illness coming in and you can yes. see it in the chart. You could, you could anticipate that there was going to be some sort of illness. What do you think having awareness of that would do for the person? Um, if it is within their karma to correct it, you know, they have the opportunity, like many people are born now with a hair lip or a club foot and they can operate on it. They, in the old days you couldn't. So you then there's many ways say it was in health uh the astute astrologer uh might say oh go get a checkup of this body part strengthen this body part uh if you're an herbalist or, or a homeopath or a physician you can start acting early mm -hmm. so saturn remember you reap and you sow i have seen people who were getting a disease a bad one and there's Saturn coming to their south node exactly in one year and they worked real 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 hard to reverse that disease by the time Saturn gets there no disease they're cured it's actually the cure Saturn can strengthen a weakness at a south node or it reveals it south node also can be some genetic karma you can also do um there's exchange karma and there's uh where you you figure out a, a, a road of action, and it has to be from your heart, to offset the karma. And I'll, I'll tell a little story from, a, this is a famous Hindu story, I love these, where a man went to an astrologer, and the astrologer said, you will be dead in three days. And so the, the, the man went off. We're never supposed to say things like that. But the astrologer went off. And I mean, the, the client went off and he cried and wept and he covered himself. He fasted and he prayed and he stopped eating and he changed himself and he didn't die. So he went back to the astrologer complaining. I fasted. I was celibate. I, I prayed for three days. And the astrologer said, you changed yourself. So the rebound karma couldn't find you. You throw the ball to the wall, it comes back and it, it needs a magnet, you're now over here, it sails by. You could also, I've seen a lot of people uh, do their karma through helping someone else. Mm -hmm. I'll give a, a classic example. I had a, a close friend and she was born with Mars and Mercury conjoined the south node and Sag in the seventh house, which rules Sag is the legs and Saturn is coming Saturn is coming when Saturn gets there she'd already broken her femur and had several other problems with her legs in life wow. so I, I see Saturn coming back her beloved dog becomes crippled mm. not her she spends the entire year carting the dog around in a little cart taking it downstairs to pee helping it pee I mean just went on and on and she didn't have to become crippled. Hmm. You see, some people will spend their life helping uh, quadriplegics instead of being one. Hmm. Uh, now, there's another kind of exchange karma, which Sybil Leake talks about. The, there was an old witch named Sybil Leake, and she was very famous in England. And she said um, she got ill as a child. And her mother uh, said, well, uh, we can put the disease into your pet owl and you'll be well. And they did. And the owl died and she got better. And of course, I thought the poor owl. <laughs> but there's a, a better story here. There's another type of exchange. There's This is a, supposedly a true story. One of the great uh, gurus of India, and I think it was Ramakrishna or Ramana Maharshi. I cannot remember all these names. But he's sitting around with his disciples at a fire and 
around a fire and he all of a sudden picks up a hot stone or potato and throws it at one of his students who catches it and gets badly burned and said, why did you do that? And the guru said, you would have died in a fire very soon had I not done that. I, I reduce the charge. So karma can be reduced in charges. Not all, Some people like a large blast. You don't have to do that. So I want to say one more thing. The cardinal fixed and mutable signs will tell you if your karma is very stubborn, very flexible, or somewhere in between. So I heard a lecture years ago by a, a, a Jyotish who was kind of a guru too. And he said that there were, there were these three kinds of karma. Some people had extremely fixed karma. They would not get out of it, hmm. you know, but still there's always some way to change things a little. Some people were like tumbleweeds with no life plan. Their charts are immutable. They can go here, they can go there. They can they usually have 12 careers, six wives. You know, there's nothing planned. They're just tumbling around like a tumbleweed enjoying the earth plane. No particular fixed karma. And you see clients like this. And then the, the average person is a bit of both you know, flexible, fixed. They're kind of in the middle. But the fixed signs, if you have Saturn in a fixed sign, uh, badly aspected, you might have a little more of, you know, stubborn fixed karma to deal with. Work with Saturn. Saturn will be your best friend. Uh, and, you know, you have to accept, accept this, figure out what you can do. What if you were suddenly left with all the kids? <laughs> this happens Saturn take it on do what you can to help yourself be uncomplaining work hard your karma gets worked off and we can't worry about the karma of the person who abandoned you they will have you theirs one day you know mm. you know the universe takes it's like a computer it takes care of things so uh, uh I'm rattling on here and people are going well what about what about grace? What about grace? Yes, there is grace. There is sudden, uh, some people get an amazing, uh, we don't know how grace happens, but I find that Neptune and Jupiter will bring grace. Uh, suddenly, you're just let off the hook. Mm. <laughs> Saved by the bell. Uh, we don't quite know why or how this happens, but it does. Or a, a uh, you know, some gurus are supposed to take on the karma or you know there's you know forgive everybody or we don't know how this happens but but some people are let off the hook very suddenly so judith would you say that people who have a lot of and and when you say fixed cardinal and mutable you, do you mean like a predominantly fixed chart or a predominantly cardinal or mutable yes um but if they're having a problem like uh that is shown you can see it in the chart by Saturn and it's in a fixed sign. You know, this is real fixed karma. They have to pay off or work with or South node in a fixed sign. Uh, mm -hmm. Say Saturn comes to the South node in the second and all of a sudden they lose all their money. Well, this is karmic. Um, I should say that about 10% of the time, the South node will bring wild good luck, just the opposite, but it's rare. But I have seen three people win lotteries. <laughs> Saturn and Jupiter came to their south node or, you know, or suddenly they don't, they're let off from the earth plane, but most of the time it's, it's, it's a difficult spot. Um, uh, so we can, there's also positive karma. Of course, we don't want to just be negative. We all have wonderful things happen to us. Uh, we tend to see these with Jupiter uh, and the north node, things coming to them, um, them coming to things. So, you know, Jupiter coming to the North Node is nice. North Node coming to Jupiter is nice by transit. And Jupiter is frequently, you know, it's always the good planet. Well, no, it's sometimes not. It can give you diabetes. But, you know, the, the, um, the chart will show you where your natal Jupiter is. And it frequently blesses the, the house, the sign, the planets it's trining, the planet it's conjunct uh, in many ways. Uh, but sometimes we're surprised to see that it just makes things uh, somewhat disorderly. It's, it's very, uh, can, can, it was the bringer of large storms in the past, you know, mm -hmm. remember the, there's a red eye on it. That's this giant storm many times bigger than the earth. Uh, it does bring, um, you know, chaos sometimes, 
too great, too great or too rapid expansion. Mm. But Jupiter's a nice planet and will show you where your grace is. Or if you're born with it rising, probably one out of 12 of you are, if you're born with it rising, you can be a source of beneficent grace or benevolence, generosity or wisdom to other people. Mm. Your life, you are to be the great something. The something is shown by the sign. Mm. I've noticed that many people I know who are busy protecting old knowledge mm. are Jupiter and Cancer. Jupiter is the protector, the archivist, the collector, rules of the memory. Cancer rules memory. Jupiter is the protector of the, the uh, you know, the memory of the culture. Uh, so you get Jupiter rising just, just on any angle strong. Remember, uh, you did this before. Um, so you're born with this ability to, to bless others and help them very much. Or maybe you were very generous before. Now, if you're jealous of that friend who has the life of Riley and uh, all the money they want, all the, all the lovely sex they want, all they get everybody, they're healthy, perfect parents, they have a lovely life, don't have to work. Well, they probably saved a village in a past life or something. So don't, don't be jealous. And if they keep just fooling around and not developing themselves, they use that up. And if you don't use your wings, you can't fly anymore. So sometimes a very difficult life is better. Mm. Those grand square people mm. that never can stop working. They will be creative. They will. Uh, one thing, Edgar Casey, the great psychic, Amanda, he, he said that the average person who works, who lives a good life, will, it, will advance about 1% each life. So you know, we, we, see, we see by what's going on in the news how little humans ever learn. So the Grand Square people are forced to learn a great deal. They have to, they get jumped up quite a notch. They, they just meet every kind of problem to solve. They have to be very, very creative, very hard workers. They can't just loaf around. This is not a rest life. And they could do a great deal of good in the world. Mm. The, the Grand Triners tend to be loafers. I've noted, noted, noted quite a few grand trainers. They have the life of Riley sometimes, but some of them just sit around in bed in earth sign, in, in water signs in particular, eating hors d'oeuvres, watching chocolate, ate chocolate, watching TV, shades drawn. I knew a grand, grand trainer in water doing that. They, they can use up the good karma they've earned by mm. loafing. Wow. And this, so, is where uh, the, this is where the debate around good and bad aspects or good and bad, it, because technically you would look at a trine and say, oh, that's good. But then it's making this person very unmotivated and, and no drive and no real passion, yeah. you know? So yeah. I think that's, that, would you agree? That's where the, to some of the debate around good and bad comes in. It's in our interpretation of what's good and what's bad. I, that's very, very astute. Um, in this system, we can give them definitions, because good and bad mean a lot of things. Good would mean anything that assists you in becoming wiser, uh, more capable, um, more helpful to humanity at large. Mm -hmm. uh, and anything that you were doing that was going in that opposite direction, like say you're smoking a lot of cigarettes and ruining your lungs. Um, this would be considered not to your advantage or harmful. So now good and bad are good for certain things and bad for others. Right. So, you know, what's good for an infant uh, isn't, uh, you know, good for an adult necessarily. Or when we're talking physical health, that might not necessarily be the same as psychological health, uh, like we know that they, you know, if we, we tie up certain kinds of music to plants, they, they love it. You tie up other types of music to plants, they dread it and move away, good or bad for the plant. Um, same with humans. So some, some people love, absolutely love doing things that aren't particularly good for them, <laughs> spiritually, psychologically, or mentally, but they love doing them. Love doing something is taste. Uh, how it affects you would be, you know, the good or the bad. Mm -hmm. I would say destructive or constructive to your spiritual growth. Now, humans are individuals, but we also are really similar. So most of the time, the same things will 
help or harm our spiritual growth. You do get individuals who are maybe, you know, immersing in something that didn't seem that smart was actually good for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, most of the time, if you want to study the effect of anything, just look, study the people who've done it all their lives and are now, you know, over 60. What was the effect on them of that activity? What do their faces look like? What do their voices sound like? What is the, what is their life around them life? You know, I've always done that since I was a child. Fascinating. Okay. So would you say that fixed karma is the equivalent to fate? Is that the same idea? Yeah. You know, uh, I know that um, uh, Chris Brennan has a lot to say on, he's written some inter- interesting article with different kinds of destiny and fate and will and not will. Uh, fixed signs would be equivalent to destiny or fate. Uh, theosophists and other you know, wisdom traditions seem to feel that when you're born, there's a plan. And the plan is definitely going to play out by age 30 or 40. Your plan may be used up after 50 or 60. And that could explain why so many older people, you know, here comes Venus. Every aspect they're going to meet somebody. And all that happens is the neighborhood dog falls in love with them. Or this happens to me all the time. Or somebody brings me flowers. You know, when you're 20, you have a lover. And, you know, you use up those karmas. Or some people, you know, start their career at 50 and never Mm -hmm. had one before. But um, I lost my train. Fate, destiny. Yeah. So when you have something very fixed, say you have the moon conjunct Saturn and the 12th house in Leo, you will have a definite destiny. Now, I know a person with that. And it was trining Jupiter in Sag. And... Uh, this person grew up in enormous poverty, you know, dumpster diving family, uh, terrible, terrible, horrible childhood from hell, terribly abused, rose up to get three degrees and become a very, very famous person doing great good for people, especially children and uh, with and in the law, the law area, uh, moon, Saturn, Pluto conjunct in Leo in the 12th house. Uh, This person had a definite karma and it's very, very clear. I know this person very well that they were probably involved in something like the inquisition in a past life. This is a very powerful person in this life uh, has the same power and intensity, but had, you know, the terrible, difficult early life used it to rise up, use the same legal power to help children. Mm. And, this is, uh, you know, the 12th house has been very strong. This person has had no end of suffering and difficulty, but has terrific, immense strength, which Saturn also brings. Mm. So you do have uh, lives that appear very destined. And we all have certain things, it appears, that will occur. We're going to meet that person. We're going to have that parent. We, we are in danger of... Um, uh, drowning at the age of 12 and astrologer warns them away. Uh, you know, the, we all have these things, uh, good and bad. It's like a, a, you know, it's like a deck of cards. And Edgar Casey says we're given, we're given, um, not given all the cards in one life. You're just mm-hmm. going to give, we have many lives. You're going to give, you're given a deck and everybody has the tragic flaw. It's like those Shakespeare plays. You're going to get your tragic flaw and you're going to get your magic superpower. <laughs> well, everybody's got the superpower. It might be they're incredibly charming and or it could be that they're very sweet or it could be that they're very scary. You know, you get your superpower and you get your tragic flaw. The chart will show these. And if the astrologer can figure it out, you're of immense value to that client. Uh, but the astro- to do this, the astrologer has to know that there are positive and directions in life. It's not all the same. You know, some things will hurt that person. So yeah, the, there is this destiny. At the same time, we have an ability to uh, change ourselves and change our karma. 
um, very, very much. But the horoscope gives the, the, the stage set for this life. It's just like a Shakespeare's play. We're on the stage and all of us are merely players and it goes really fast. So we have our, you know, all of us meet choices in life. Ah, the choice. When transit Saturn comes and squares your nodes, Jupiter can do it too. Progress moon can do it too. You will have to choose between two roads. One will be spiritually good for you. One will be spiritually bad for you. Mm. Now, Amanda, about your question about destiny. If these are the nodes are in fixed signs, oh boy, it's a either or. It's, should I move and be with my wife on the West Coast or should I stay here alone drinking and smoking on the East Coast? Um, you know, sitting in front of the TV. They'll be very stark. And it's very clear when will be good for you, but harder. It's all the North Node is always hard, um, it's just that way. Um, mutable will tend to mean you can blend the sides. It's a lot nicer. So you know it is harder to have fixed nodes. You will find when Saturn gets to it's called the bends when transit Saturn or, and transit Jupiter get to the bends, you will be confronted with a spiritual choice. Um, when Jupiter comes to the north node in particular, it can be the south node, you get a spiritual opportunity or Jupiter coming to conjoin or trine your sun. You get a spiritual opportunity, sometimes an opportunity to work with a teacher or change your life to a good road. You know, this is, this is something to look for. We have spiritual opportunities too. Um, so the, uh, the choices in life, uh, we will find that's a very important transit. And you, it's, it's going to be even more intense if you have your nodes on, on the angles. Uh, then it's really, uh, really strong. Should I get married and give up my career or not? Um, should I commit suicide or go back to business? I mean, people have these choices. They come up to them and they'll, the, the Saturn will sit there for a whole darn year in between the nodes, going back and forth, back and forth. Happens to everybody twice every about 18.9 years. Mm. So this is all, all you got to do is look at your nodes and see when Saturn gets right in between them, squaring both of them. And again, Jupiter can do this too. It's there every almost 12 years. What about Pluto? Well, I imagine Pluto could do it too. Boy, I hadn't thought of that. And I haven't seen too many so keep your eyes perked i don't oh, know everything I, I had it and you yes, did yes Can we you? wouldn't be here today if i didn't have it so really <laughs> oh yeah everything blew up it was crazy yeah. and it'll sit there a year or two <laughs> exactly exactly well, well, did yes. you find you had to choose between oh, a spiritual yes. road and a not oh, spiritual road completely i mean that was my whole like trajectory in new york city versus leave it all behind and go to hawaii and like obliterate my life. <laughs> but, but it was a very spiritual path. It was like, okay, follow your heart, your intuition this way, or stay here and just gain more material, you know, accumulation. Yes, the North. Yeah. Yeah. So this it was that, is the that, thing in the South node, yeah, the South node rose are always bad. I tell people when they're in that fix, like you had, when they're forced with that choice, I say, make the choice dependent on how you would feel on your deathbed. Exactly. Pretend I, kept, that's she, I say that all the time. I, I kept seeing this trajectory and I was like, okay, here's one path. And I see where that path is going. Ooh, I don't think I want that life. You know, don't yeah. know my children, totally no nature in our lives, yeah. totally disconnected. Or I go this path and there's a lot of unknown, but there's a lot of like potential and beauty that could come from it. So, yeah. yes. Yes. And, and so the, that's the right choice, not the money not the wealth. Now, usually the wrong choice is baited with delightful temptations. Oh, yeah. Always baited. And, and I always, you know, now somebody, a lot of your viewers are interested in spiritual matters, undoubtedly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of viewers are on some kind of dedicated spiritual path. Now, being in this business a long time is have you, uh, you will always notice that right as a person starts to make spiritual progress, a great temptation tailored just for them will come along. Now, you know, it says in the Bible, thou shalt not eat bats. So nobody ever comes to the door going, mm, a bat. I heard that on some show 
20 years ago. You know, that, but you know, if you like, if you like a redheaded man in tight jeans, that person will appear at the door <laughs> and pull you off your spiritual path. Um, you know, you know, this is just a given and I warn all my students about it and it never fails. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. So true. Okay. Another question. So you've talked a lot about the nodes. You've, I love this idea of rebound karma and that if it can't, if you change, it can't come back to you. So like you're the target that has to move. And so yes. as you, as you work with the karma and you change and you, you no longer fulfill that location for that ball to come back to, then you've moved on from that karma. So you've talked about that. You said something about using up karma and, and I'm just curious about that. So let's say you go through your first 30, 40 years of life and you use up all your karmic, um, energy and energy from before, you know, past life. Is it then you start to create new karma? Cause aren't we always with what we're deciding and saying and doing and thinking in the moment we're creating karma for the future. So would you say that then it's almost like we're free from the past and now it's about creating what we want for the future? Yes. Uh, some people, it's rarer. Some people use up their karma in the life they're in. Uh, the chart will ah. give hints of it and so all their life and they're free. Sometimes they feel as if they're in a ghost town of their own life. Nothing, nothing happens anymore. It's just... Mm. You know, it's up to them, completely up to them what they want to do with their last 20 years. This does happen. And so um, everything you do, you know, karma works. Everything you do is starting a new train of karma. You, know, you and I speaking today is starting a whole train of karma. So every single moment, two things are happening. You're having uh, all the effects from the past, but you're also having first cause so think think of a bunch of lines all moving together like this and at one point i wish i could hold up a picture but they join in the middle just like the middle of a horoscope mm -hmm. that moment could not have been forever predicted it's a brand new individual birth in the universe and every moment has this potential mm -hmm. so you start up a whole new line of karma so the chart the chart has it not only shows the habit you know the uh, law of habit what we were always doing what we did over and over uh from past lives now some people just didn't develop any one thing and that'll show in the chart you know they were they were a farmer they were this they were that um if people were servants that will tend to show in the chart with a a, a nature that loves to help people but isn't very egocentric um if some if people floated around their whole life being mendicant uh, you know, yogis and, and making everybody feed them and clothe them and meditating, they might be very at loss if they were born in modern day New York and had to fend for themselves, um, where nobody's going to just cater to them all day. And they can't, you know, there's no peace, there's no mountaintop, you get a lot of strange situations. Everything about your own life and proclivities what you naturally are drawn to, what, what you do, didn't come out of a hat. Yeah. You know, every mother who's had 16 children knows that every one of them comes in with their unique personality. It is, it's partly nurture and it's a lot nature. Judith, that brings me on. to my next question. How early would you start to talk to children about their past lives or their potential energetic past? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a question no one's ever, ever asked me before. <laughs> that's a fantastic question. If the child is already, uh, one of my clients said that her little girl at the age of, as soon as she could talk, sat in the high chair and said, out of the blue, I was your mother in a past life, in the last life. Wow. And the child, child knew nothing about reincarnation. Another child I know was insisting he was this particular Tibetan monk who had died in a riot even though he knew nothing about it. If a child is doing that, ask them questions before they lose it. You know, totally. they, they have, they have usually when they're two or three, it can still be there. I was such a child. I was remembering 
a past life and weeping and weeping about it when I was very young. I didn't get over it till I was 12. Um, now, this is, of course, to the parents that believe in reincarnation. You know, most of the world does. Uh, it's the, the Judeo-Christian religions uh, tend to not, but they have their, their sects that do you know, like some of the Gnostics and so forth. So um, I remember there's a part in the Bible where Jesus said, did you not recognize John? That was Elias returned. That somehow did not get removed from the Bible, but it's in there. Wow. Um, but I'm not here to be, a, you know, to, to insist other people believe as I do. I'm totally respectful of the, the, the I call them mono lifers. <laughs> we have one life, better live it well. Um, so, Sometimes we don't want to dig around in past lives. You know, sometimes uh, there's a reason they're hidden from us. That's what Edgar Casey said. We have enough on our plate this time. Uh, sometimes to bring, you know, to go into deep hypnosis and bring a past life up can cause mental problems. Mm -hmm. But that's why every case is unique. If, if a three-year-old is prattling on about their past life, it doesn't seem to be an issue here. I'd, I'd say get more information. Mm -hmm. It'll help you. Uh, but sometimes a past life is causing a problem, right. a neurosis, a mental problem. Uh, and our present psychologists don't include that as one of their etiologies. Mm -hmm. The Renaissance uh, and you know, some of these older systems, they include etiologies we don't now. And certainly not all problems are due to past lives, but some of them are. Yeah. And there have been a few psychologists who have worked successfully with overcoming phobias, you know, it's usually a, a bad death that's causing it. Mm. I have seen a few, I do medical astrology a lot. I've seen a few panic cases who had charts that looked like they had been terribly tortured in a past life. And these are the people just constantly going into intense panic and they need to be put on horse tranquilizers. Um, and this is not always the reason for panic. It's a possibility of a few possibilities and should not be overlooked. And uh, one was just so clear though, you know, everything and about when it. When they had the awareness, did it, did it shift for them? Understanding it, the source of it? This is a really good question. There, there is proof that that is true. There is a, a famous psychologist. I cannot remember his name. I think his first name was David, but he did a, I got hold of his book and he did a type of psychology that, he would bring people into deep, 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 deep hypnosis to where they were reliving the death or the incident like they were burned in a fire that mm -hmm. has brought on the present phobia. Mm -hmm. He would tape them. And I've heard the tapes where they go into this other life or accent or they're screaming. And when he plays them back the tape, the phobia would disappear. Wow. And I unfortunately cannot remember his name or the name of the book, but I got the book and I got the tapes and these are so chilling and real. Do not listen to them if you are faint of heart because uh, you're hearing the tapes of people being burned alive and so mm -hmm. forth. And they're in different voices. And this would then apparently, he gave many, many cases in the book and the strange phobias would vanish. Mm -hmm. However, you know, I don't recommend this because when you're going to work with a hypnotherapist, you better know who you're working with. Oh yeah. They're going to have total control over the dials. And you also might uncover something you can't put back down. You know, the, these memories go down into the deep, 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 deep subconscious. And they're tied up with a little pink bow. They can leak. They leak up. And all of a sudden, now this is important. Edgar Casey talked about this. Something has to trigger by resonance the leak. Now, if you have a glass and you hit it with a certain vibration, if you sing a certain vibration, a glass will break. Yeah. If a similar situation happens in this life, it can make the old memory trigger. So Edgar Casey had a case where a woman was fine and she was traveling and she passed over a certain region where she almost died of an asthmatic attack suddenly. Never had this happen before. And Edgar Casey said she had been suffocated when a root cellar collapsed on her in a past life in that region. Mm. The resonance woke up the memory and she had the attack again. So your chart can show you when this can happen. 
Mm -hmm. Say if the person is having just all of a sudden they're going into terrible fear of water. Um, and you look at the chart and they have South node in cancer in Pisces in a water sign hinting of death in a, uh, the people die all the time in shipwrecks, uh, maybe a shipwreck in a past life. And here comes progressed moon or Saturn or something that's going to wake up the memory mm. and you can see what's going on. So if it's happening with the South node, things passing over the south node or the transit south node passing over something and the person's all of a sudden having a wake up of a strange memories dreams fears that is likely to be a sign that this is a past life memory once the person just realizes though they don't have to realize what happened but they realize they're having a past life memory and they're you strengthen the conscious mind that can say okay i'm going to put you back to sleep you can't get rid of the tapes, but Amanda, you can add to the tape. You can say, I'm in control now. That life is over. You are fine. You are, I'm going to add to the tape. You are safe now. You are fine. Mm -hmm. That horrible experience is in your memory bank, but you're fine now. And the person can really move on. Um, I know this because I was born with this case. Now, if, if um, you are born with South Node rising, especially in a water sign this can also moon water is memory Pro, your moon is on a south node in a water sign your sun is on the south node in a water sign especially on the ascendant could be 12th house 8th house 4th house you might be more prone to strong memories bothering you i call it um you know it's a past life memory interference you should be free to live this life uh, but if you're born back too fast you didn't get to rest in the beautiful little astral worlds. You might have this problem. Once you realize this is what go, what's going on. Uh, I'll give you an example. When I was young, I was so terribly shy. I could not meet any adult. If the doorbell rang, I would run and hide in a closet. My mother, she out of the was, you know, immigrant Jew, and she wore very, very long skirts down to the ground. I'd hide in her skirts, and she dragged me out. I would just be absolutely petrified. And once I, I realized this was something going on, in our, you know, in my memory bank, and I was going to have to be a speaker, uh, and I just look at it and I go, "Okay, you, you go sit in the corner and don't bother me, you memory." I could, I'm still uncomfortable being, uh, you know, in front of people. But I've become extremely relaxed. I just forget it. I said, go sit in the corner. I have to take control. Your eternal spirit is a separate from all of this memory nonsense. Just like you are no longer three. You are no longer 12. You are no longer that silly adolescent you once were. Um, you are now, but you are, you're always this eternal soul. You now can control this. You do have the power. And people who are a little weak on their vital force or ego have a little more trouble with this. Um, but one can learn to overcome these things and the chart chart always gives a clue, you know, it always does. Um, so today I'm, I'm completely nonplussed in front of large groups of people. Cause I, I tell the scared memory to go sit in a corner Yeah, and I'm, well, I'm not at all are. concerned. Yeah. I'm, and I'm not at all concerned what caused the memory right. poking around in your subconscious, trying to figure out what caused the memory. That's where you can get in trouble. You can, right. So sometimes it's helpful and sometimes it's harmful. Um, so you talked about Saturn and, and this is going to be my last question, I think, <laughs> but you okay. talked about a Good lot question. about Saturn, um, how uh, this can be the bringer of wisdom. It also is a place of limitation or difficulty um, that we're, if we don't proactively address it, we may be forced to work with it. So I would love to know what you mean by work with our Saturn. So what do you specifically mean by proactively working with it versus letting it work on us? Okay, that is, you're an expert at this. These good questions that put me to task, <laughs> I have to think. So Saturn, if you don't work with your Saturn, you will be forced to, that's a good takeaway, you know? And, and so Saturn will be in a house, and of course, you might use different house systems. I always prefer whole sign house for various reasons, but you all have your favorite system. Saturn, you look and you see, well, what are the limitations being caused? Uh, you look at the sign. The sign is always important to the decanate. Um, 
Scorpio is always a doozy for people. Um, so then, you know, you look at what actually is the problem and what is your attitude to the problem? So are you frustrated? You're just, fr say a lot of people with Saturn and Scorpio uh, have been prevented from having a decent sex life or all kinds of things go wrong and they're always betrayed or whatever it might be. So rather than spending your life disgruntled and frustrated, you make a study of it. And Saturn, mm -hmm. so wisdom, so you, st you study what, if it's in Scorpio, what, what is sex? What is its use? What is it really for? Because every time you've tried to have it, you know, you either get pregnant or you get abandoned or something horrible thing happens and you're unhappy. And, you know, this isn't the case for all Saturn and Scorpios. I'm talking about the ones that, you know, have it very difficult. But um, you look at the issue. You're going to suffer some deprivation. Accept the deprivation. It's just for a time. If we think this is our only life, this makes it much more difficult. If you have an eternal view, it really doesn't matter if you're frustrated this life. And it may just be for seven years of this life or 14 years of this life. Um, but you have some frustration. If you're given an obligation, you're suddenly you have to, you have to give up your career and take care of your aging mother. There's Saturn in Cancer. I knew a woman who was born son and Saturn in Cancer in the 12th house. She didn't have to take care of one, but two aging parents. And she was the only child. Mm. She never complained. She just did it. And yes, she was, uh, her life was hard. You accept hardness. Our culture just likes all pleasure. Now everything has to be nice, nice, happy, happy. But you accept your lot and you do it as best as you can. And you do it cheerfully, but you study the, you know, you study karma, you study reincarnation, you study the topic, is the issue sex? Is it obligation to family? Is it commitment? Is it an issue about how to handle money? Is it Saturn, is it ego power, power and ego? How to use it correctly? Is it Taurus, how to use money correctly? Um, just as many Saturn and Tauruses have a lot of wealth as those that are poor. They have their, their issue is money and how to, you know, what is the spiritual correct way to deal with it? So Saturn always is discipline, always is uh, acceptance of the fate, doing your work without constantly whining and complaining and struggling or trying to get out of it. That's when you're going to get in trouble. Say you have Saturn and Aries. That's a fun one, isn't it? So that one is the, the little truck that runs out and bashes into things until it learns all its lessons. So you're either going to be forced to be very independent in life, you know, be a little adult from the time you're 10, be self-made person, be a pioneer, and therefore you gain great strength and leadership in being a pioneer and self-made person. Um, or you could just run around refusing to uh, abide by any law and end up in prison. And there you sit for 30 years because you were stupid. And you didn't, you just want to do what you wanted to do. And you, cause you want to buck Saturn. Saturn falls in Aries. Why? Because Saturn is the law. Saturn, why is Saturn exalted in Libra? The scales does very well because the scales meet out your rebound karma. <laughs> People with Saturn and Libra, if they play around with marriage and relationships, always here comes Saturn. Uh, do you remember Zsa Zsa Gabor? She was a famous Hollywood actress. She's probably long gone. And yeah. Zsa Zsa Gabor, Z-S-A, uh, she was married, you know, five or six times, which is extraordinary in those days. And she had Venus, I believe, I do this from memory, I believe she had Venus and Aries opposing Saturn and Libra. Every time she fell in love, she had to get married. So, you know, everybody's case is unique. So, Although, although Amanda, I'm answering your question uh, individual, you know, generally, the astrologer has to answer that question, as you well know, very individually for every person, and that's what our craft is about. Mm -hmm. So Saturn brings wisdom. It's this great scholar Saturn. You know, Mercury's the, the just. I'm reading the want ads. I'm reading the newspaper. Saturn's the scholar. 
you know, those monks were always shown scholar. You mm -hmm. study deeply and you figure out for your, you know, you figure out what is that that Saturn is asking of you and mm -hmm. then stop, stop kicking against it because you're not going to get out of it. All the kicking in the world, just going to give you trouble. And then when you learn your lesson of Saturn, you have this uh, grace, you have this amazing uh, knowledge and wisdom and you no longer are so frustrated with your plight, you know, that, that you didn't get all the cookies in that area of life. <laughs> you know? Wow. So beautiful. So helpful, Judith. I, you are just a wellspring of knowledge and wisdom for us. And I'm just, again, so grateful that you were here today to help us understand how we can look at the astrological chart, how our uh, stories of reincarnation are in there, how our stories of karma are in the chart as well. And then giving us some clues as to how to actually work with those things, how to identify them in the chart. I know this is like something you could probably dedicate your life to studying. Like it would be endless. Um, but I love that you brought up your book so people can start there. And um, it's the lunar nodes. And yes. you, so you can check out that book. And then if, Judith, if people want to learn more from you, if they want to learn more about your work, find you online, where do they go? judithhillastrology.com and you'll see the academy for astrological medicine there and i also um for your viewers may want to know that if they contact me i have a coupon for a special class i'm giving over at at the matthew wood institute uh, right now but contact me personally and i can get that coupon to you uh, if you're interested in that but i've got lots of classes and courses on my website judithhillastrology.com and this has been very lovely. And we want to let everybody know we did not color coordinate and we did not get our yellow flowers and our color coordination deliberately. This was completely a surprise to us both. Yes, absolutely. Well, I have been looking forward to this for a very long time, Judith, and it's just been such a pleasure to share your wisdom and your expertise with our audience. And again, it sometimes we, there's these astrologers that are just hold so much, you know, you hold so much for us. And so I'm so grateful that you're here and that you're sharing that wisdom with so many people and um, that we get to continue carrying on the legacy of the beauty of this craft, you know? Just well, and, and can I say too, that that is just so wonderful that you are doing this for the astrology community that you're having interviews with many of the older astrologers who have really a great deal of wealth and treasures to give the younger generation and you're also interviewing the younger generation which i am learning from oh, we are all learning awesome. from each other that yeah, to me I is take the lessons. perfection. Yes, that is the perfection of the design. There's so much to learn from everybody. And I love that we get to highlight all of it. And I think that the Capricorn part of me loves the, the lineage, the deep lineage, the deep roots and the, you know, that, that wisdom that's there. And then the Aquarian part of me just like, but there's something to learn from everybody. So let's bring it all together. <laughs> um, and, and I know that everybody benefits on, on all the, the sides of it. So, oh. <sighs> So brilliant, Judith. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for tuning in, for being here, for being a part of this community, for making astrology a part of your life now and always. All right, everybody take care and we'll see you on the next episode. <laughs>